everybody, and welcome to this episode of Mastering Midlife, How to Thrive When the World Asks. The most of you, I am your host, Mark Silverman. Today, I have the pleasure of having a conversation with a Grammy-nominated singer and songwriter, Stephen Kellogg. I first came in contact with Steve uh, through his TED Talk, not through his music, and I watched his TED Talk on Jazz Satisfaction, which we'll put the link into in the show notes, and was really enamored with who he is and what he talks about. So then I found his music and absolutely fell in love. He was named uh, Armed Forces Entertainer of the Year, so you can tell that he's got a big heart and phil philanthropy is part of his life. He's the author of an upcoming book called Objects in the Mirror, A Storyteller's Guide to What Matters Most, which is really incredible, and that's the name of his new album, which is really, really good. There's an Amazon documentary called Last Man Standing All About Him. I know Chris, you're sitting here going, wow, you know, you know, just go on and on, Mark, about every, everything that I'm doing and everything I've accomplished. Uh, uh, and I just saw him at Wolf Trap uh, for the first time live, and uh, uh, Jimmy, Jimmy Buffett's got nothing on, uh, and, on Mr. Kellogg here and, and how he holds an audience. Uh, I was blown away. So, Stephen, thank you so much for being on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. So uh, the question is, if you're writing this book, what does matter most? Well, um, you know, that, it's funny because I started, I started working on this book and I thought I was just going to kind of riff and have some essays. And, and it turns out writing a book is so much harder than I thought it was going to be. I mean, I, I, every author I meet now, I just want to buy them a coffee or something because I just, it's a, it's a thing. And so luckily I, I, I hooked up with a good editor and we started honing what the book would be and arrived at a series of essays about the things that matter most in life, right? So I've actually since, and because the book's not done yet, and I'm on the third draft, and it's actually now the subtitle. I think is I think is actually going to be "Thoughts on a Perfect Life for Imperfect People," um, because it is a collection of essays about what matters most. But it's the it's I, I feel like what I have to bring to that conversation is more just. And that I'm an open book about how often I screw up and how often my life goes sideways. And I think that that will be most helpful to people. You know, I, so, you know, following you now for a little while, what I would say is you're more of a, uh, of a, an observation of the possibilities of life an exploration of life uh, rather than how to screw up more of the explanations of when you screw up, when you succeed uh, is what I get from your work. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and kind of, you know, looking at it and thinking, you know, how do you, how do you keep a sense of humor about this? How do you make, you know, how do you make it better, but also, you know, not beat yourself up all the time. I mean, it just it shuts you down when you're so hard on yourself all the time. You know, like so many of us are. You just. Uh, you go through your life that way, and I don't want that for myself. I don't want that for the people that I care about. I mean, I don't want that for anybody, if possible. So my hope in this book is that we touch on key topics. You know, the first part of the book is relationships. So it's, there's an essay on marriage, one on kids, parents. Um, you and I were just talking a minute ago about this place in midlife where you've got your parents needing you on one side and then your kids needing you on the other and you you're like this this was unexpected you know um so the first part of the book is relationships and it's a series of essays about that and the second part of the book is everything else that matters it's time health uh forgiveness integrity sense of humor you know all and each of those is one vignette really um and sort of a few thoughts and insights a few anecdotes it's 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 a mixture. I'm not sure that this is going to be a Pulitzer Prize winning book. I'm just trying to get through it at this point. I'm trying to, I keep saying to Kirsten, my wife, I'm just trying to not embarrass our, our family legacy here. <laughs> you know, so it's interesting because you come at it from, a, from a, what people would identify out from you because you have a rock star lifestyle. Right, you get to wear a bandana, you get to stand on stand on stage, and you get to cuss, and you get to have a good time, right? And you have four beautiful daughters and a lovely wife and a and a regular life, also, exactly. right? So you you so so you you have the opportunity to to actually divorce yourself from real life, but you also have an opportunity being an artist to 
to express what it's like. Yeah, yeah. And and you made a decision a long time ago uh, to not pursue commercial over authentic. Well, yeah, I don't think I realized I was I was um, I wasn't consciously making that decision, but hindsight. I definitely was doing that. You know, when we got, I got signed to my first big, bigger record deal with Universal in 2004. And I can still remember, you know, I wanted to put a pedal steel in, uh, on this track. So I did. And I remember the A&R guy's disappointment. He said, Oh, why did you do that? Ah, gosh, right up to that point. It was, it was really, and I got so mad at him. I mean, I really threw like a temper tantrum. And and he, and so they said, okay, okay, it's cool. The pedal steel stays, you know. But in some subconscious way, I, I was, I think I was sort of sabotaged. I mean, I think that guy probably did know what he was doing. I think he was probably right in terms of what the aim was and sort of what their aspiration was. And I was so passionate about in my disagreement about this relatively small thing and I wasn't consciously saying I'm gonna stand up for what's authentic here or anything like that but but I made a lot of decisions like that for better or for worse along the way where I would just you know kind of probably shot some opportunities in the foot and, and I don't think that's actually a bad thing I think it was leading me towards this place that I am now at 42 where I go, well, this is what I'm about. This is what I, this is my gospel, you know? Um, and that, and I can say that now, but it was, I was sort of doing it in a very hapless way for most sure. of my career here. You so know? you, so you joke, you joke that you're, that you're Raffi for adults. <laughs> that's, yeah. your, that's your, that's your, that's your, your, your standing joke there. But tell how does that feel now that, now that you've had the journey where you know who you are and you know what you do for people, Rather than being a joke. And, I, and I do know who I am and what I do for people, but we're always evolving. I think, you know, I know the name of your of this podcast, Mastering Midlife. I think one of the things that I'm just catching on to is midlife does not mean we you don't become an adult and then go, well, okay, now I've figured out what it all means and now I'll just coast for the rest of my life as an adult. No. I mean, we're still in process. We're always in process. And that might sound a little new agey, but, it, but it's like that's actually helpful to me to realize I don't necessarily know what I'm about or what I'm doing. I mean, I know what I'm trying to do right now and who I'm trying to evolve into. And it's become pretty apparent that for as many times as I try to say, well, I'm going to write about other things now, I always end up back on writing about family, writing about raising kids, writing about being married, writing about financial struggles and or, you know, the with how to celebrate the wins and manage the losses. You know, I mean, these themes, I do keep coming back to them, which is why I joke that I'm Raffi for adults. It's so much about family. And I keep thinking I've really got to write about something else. And then the albums tend to, I, it's like I can't help myself. So um, I guess in some degrees, yeah, I have settled on this. But, you know, there's still a part of me, even in writing a book now, I'm like, now is when I'm going to venture out into some other territory. And as much as I try to do it, I find myself, you know, back on these themes. You know, it's, I guess it's where my heart is, I guess. So you, so you go there. But um, I, I, think what you, I think what you said, never underestimate the importance of staying true to what it, what it is you do. Yeah. You've gotten it wrong. Yeah. Before, and it hurts. That's, that's, you know, that's what you've said. Where, yeah. Tell me something about that. Yeah, well, it's true. You know, I mean, I, I, in, in an effort to, you think, okay, this is who I am, but this isn't enough. I don't, my, my dreams haven't all been met yet. So there's got to be something else. And you're searching for what that something else is. And sometimes you end up in a place of kind of just like limited authenticity, you know. I, I feel that way when I'm trying to write a song that isn't, that just doesn't feel like me. I'm trying to be, I, 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 this isn't quite right, but I, I'm trying to be cooler than I am, you know. I'm trying to, <laughs> hey, let me try this hat on for a minute. And you get it wrong, and then what happens is not only do you not have, um, 
a song that you're excited about, but it just, it's never worked. It's never worked for me yet. Like I've never had that option of like, Hey, you know what? I'm just going to go straight and try to do what the man wants me to do. And then, you know, the, the universe has never rewarded that. So not only are you not, do you not win big, but you're sort of still left with, um, you know, you don't even have a song you like. You, you didn't make the money, you didn't get the acclaim and the fame, but you also don't have anything that you're proud of. And that's what hurts so much. It's just, it's a, a big loss across the board, you know, so. Um, how, did you, how, did, how, did you, how did you learn so much about yourself that you're able to actually gauge that and feel that in your body and know when you're, when you're off your, your trajectory? Well, it's usually, um, it's usually in hindsight <laughs> that I realize it. You know, it's usually once I bumbled and made, and made a mistake, you know, like that, that you go, oh, man, I didn't, I think of the last time I was on a major record label, okay, and they said, Stephen, we really like, we like you, man, we're trying to, we want you to succeed, but you've got to give us a song that we can get on the radio. So, in hindsight, maybe the super healthy way to have approached that situation would have been, um, okay, like, let me just keep searching for something that feels very distinctly me, but also could be commercially. But instead, I sort of worked backwards, like, okay, what's on the radio? What, what do they want? And so I didn't really get it right. I mean, in that instance, I, I, I flew out to LA and I worked with this these guys who made hit songs and everything about it felt wrong, but I thought, well, maybe, maybe they know more than I do. And in the process, I mean, and I don't want to get stuck on this, but it's like we ended up actually plagiarizing a melody from Simon and Garfunkel, <laughs> you know, and you can justify it and talk. It was, it wasn't like this seriously Machiavelli and like, we'll take this and we'll do that. But it, but we, I ended up in the most, murky ethical place I've ever been in my life. I ended up sort of letting my band down. In the end, the song didn't go. The label had to deal with like, they got it on the radio and then there was pushback about the fact that it was, I mean, it was a disaster. It was the biggest professional disaster I've ever had. And I didn't know, I wasn't some, you know, Zen wizard in the moment going like, we are, we are all, we have off our trajectory. I just, eventually just knew I felt so badly that I was off my trajectory, you know. If I'm going to translate that into, into so the business people who, who listen to this podcast, yeah. it, you know, what I know about midlife, when, you know, in, in our 20s and our 30s, we're just kind of powering on through. We're trying things and we're, we're ro you know, we're rocking and we're moving, you know, we're, everything is so exciting and new. Uh, and, and the challenges are, are, are exciting and new that we don't really feel a lot of that. At some point, some of us younger than others, some of us other, but our bodies start to tell us when things are right and when they're not. So the people that I coach and that I work with, I try and slow them down so that they can get that feeling of what, what is that internal whisper trying to tell you. Yeah. A lot of people ignore that and then go off the deep end and they don't even know. They just slowly ignore that nudge towards authenticity, towards something different. And it, is it always with you, Mark, when you're, when you are coaching something like this, is it always, um, it, is it always of an ethical nature or is it, I mean, or, or is it just like the trajectory of the businesses they're building are getting? The ethical is the easy one. The yeah. ethical, it just like, and you go past it and, and really the consequences are always, even if you're successful, the consequences are annoying. So that's like, that's like the loud one. It's the soft one going, you know what? I just don't want to do this this way anymore. I just don't want to do, like it's still, it's still legal, it's still fine, but it just, it's not me anymore. That, that people can identify out and go, you know, Stephen Kellogg, he's, he's, a, he's, a, he's, a, he's an artist. Of course he's going to stay true to myself. I'm a business person and I got to feed mouths. But you have four children to feed and a wife who counts on you. So yeah. the push to be commercial may even be more because it's so close. You could, you could taste being on a bigger stage and being on the Billboard Awards and have that money coming in. Yeah, I mean, to be so close for 20 years... Um, and to, you know, to always be one little move away, one thing, you know, and to, you've tasted at times, you have a song that sort of 
starts reacting or gets used somewhere, you're in it. Um, and so there's always this temptation of if I just move a little left or right, like maybe we change the game in terms of who we can reach and what's possible. And um, and I also thought it was interesting what you said about, uh, you know, even outside of the ethics, just that that voice. When I'm considering the different things I can do, I find myself opportunities come up and I have to catch myself because I just want to do them all. I think, you know, I, I do more speaking now and sometimes someone says, oh, can you come speak? And my go-to is always just, yes, absolutely, without occasionally asking, is this actually good for them, good for me? Like, is this, you know, I, and it's, it's the voice, you know, it can sound a little cutesy to say, listen to that voice, but it's, it's, it's real, you know? I'm, you know, I, was, I, I, I have, uh, my practice is basically full. I have one slot left for another client, and then I can't take on any more clients. But I have a tax bill coming up. So I'm divorced, right? And I, you know, I had elderly parents. So like I, when I switched from high tech, uh, which, would you, which you would call the mainstream music thing, to coaching, I, you know, I, I did some damage to myself financially. So I need the money, right? Like even though I have a full practice, I'm kind of digging out of a hole and all that. And I'm coaching a guy and thinking, you know, and this is the guy to fill my last slot, pay that tax bill, right? Right. And uh, someone asked me, so are you going to coach that guy? I said, well, actually, we have a second meeting for free because I'm not so sure he's my guy. Like, I want his money. I'd love to coach him. He's a great guy. But my, that, I don't have that internal yes. And to have the, for me to have the integrity to say, you know what, if I say yes to someone who isn't my people, Two months down the line, he's going to think I'm a crappy coach because right. I'm not his people. He's not my people, right. right? He's not bad. I'm not bad. But I have, to, I, have to stay, I have to stay in the integrity of who I know I can work with and who I can make beneficial. Yeah. yeah. And I think, that's, I think that, you know, that for me, that's, that's the counsel I have for almost everybody that I work with, that you do have a gut feeling of which business deals are good for you and which business deals are not, which partnerships are good and which partnerships are not, and which direction to go in. Absolutely. I, I can, you can never hear that enough, too, because I, uh, I catch myself just, you know, part of my personality. I'm not, this isn't something I'm proud of, but I just, I always, I, want, I always want more. You know, I always, I'm always looking, no matter, and my life is great. I love this situation. But you always want more in what sense? Like, do you, do you want a Mercedes or do you want, what well, do you want more of? And, and the, I'm the guy who will come off stage from a great show like Wolf Trap, whether you were out, have a ball. I'll just have a great time. And I will get, and I'll, but I'll see that one of my friends played the Ryman that night and I'll think, ah, they're really happy. You know, like they've really got what I want. You know, I mean, and I, I wouldn't trade places with anybody, but I do, I'd be lying to say that I don't experience. But how do you deal with it now? So you have, you have very human feelings of a little envy, a little bit of jealousy, a little, a little projection that that made them happy. Yeah. What's that? A little projection that that made them happy. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, a lot of projection that that made them happy. I mean, intellectually, I know that's not the case. And I'm, I mean, these are people I'm rooting for. It's not that I don't want them to have their wins. It's just that those are still aspirations of mine that I'm chasing. You know, I want to, I want to reach more people, and I want to, you know, I want to make more money. I want to, I want to, you know taste the foods I've never tasted. I'm just, those are always things. And, and in terms of how I deal with it, on a good day, I deal with it by setting to work and aiming high, you know, more high. And on a, on, on a bad day, I sort of slip into, I'm capable of slipping into a melancholy disposition that kind of broods and feels like I failed somehow, you know. And uh, I'm enough of a, I'm enough of an adult now. I've read up on this enough. I felt it, I, to know that it's that you just go through it. You try not to add drama to it. You just experience. Yeah, hey, this is my personality. This is yeah, who yeah. I am. One man's Girl. floor is another man's ceiling. You know, Tiger Woods says. But before Tiger Woods had his uh, now uh, life transformational uh, episodes, you know, he said, you know, what you know what they call the person who comes in second, the first loser. You know. So one man's floor is another man's ceiling. You make a living doing what you love. 
you get to play places like Wolf Trap, right? You get uh, the reviews of your albums are stellar. Your fans are so in love with you, right? So one man's floor is another man's ceiling. You let you had someone come up on stage uh, at Wolf Trap who was washing dishes and was on uh, The Voice or America's Got Talent or something and didn't get picked, right? Uh, and blew the roof off the place like an otherworldly talent like could leave the whole room in tears yeah didn't make it washing dishes right so one man floor is another man's ceiling but it's so human to go and i failed (laughs) like i didn't break through yeah yeah and nobody and nobody who's uh, you know who's looking at your floor as their ceiling wants to hear about that. I mean, that's not really, you. I know that's not the high side of kind of me. But it's but it, real. But it is a part. Yeah, it's the same part that lets the songs in. It, you just feel everything so deeply and you experience things. And, and so now I can, now I get that. But in my 30s and in my 20s, I, I think I just, you know, I felt some degree of embarrassed, shame about that. You know, mm-hmm. I think I, uh, this is not good. I shouldn't be this way, you know, and it, it drove me in a different way, ways. I'm able to handle it in more stride, a little more evenly now. than I so, probably- that's a, so that's an interesting evolution. So in your 20s and 30s, you handled it a certain way, and that's unsustainable. Like you couldn't, you couldn't stay married and in relationship with your wife, stay sober, you know, and, and, a, and a hardworking dude, you know, putting out quality work and still let that other stuff eat at you. It just because yeah you couldn't because it becomes who you are you become embittered you know and you who want you don't want to be that person there's you, you do meet people who arrive at midlife cynical and that's just, it's just not, it's just not a productive way to be cynical it's like make things better make things improve them if you don't like the way they are. But cynicism and embitterment are such a rotten legacy to be passing on to the next generation. You know, I, think, I personally think it's a call to evolve. You know, when you start to feel that resentment, when you start to feel that bitterness, it's a call to find something else. What, so how do you deal with it now? What's, what's different now in your 40s than was in your 30s? Well, you know, I don't, I don't, I I am able to step back from it and say, okay, that's been their road to walk and my road in this kind of, brings around what you're earlier, what we were talking about earlier, but my road to walk was, okay, I am, I am going to connect deeply with the people I'm going to connect with. And that might, I might be the indie movie. I might not be the Avengers, but I will be that indie movie that people talk about, you know? Uh, so if you can follow that analogy for just a minute, <laughs> It's, it's like, it's accepting your, your role and saying, I'm not going to worry about connecting with everybody all the time. Let me look at where the, where the light is. Let me look at where the work is going really well. What's really good? What do I actually seem to have to offer this situation? And then let me offer it, you know, with everything I got. Here's, here's everything I know about it. And, you, and that is really what my art has become. It's what my talks have become. It's what this book is going to be about. It's like, here's everything I know about these things, you know. And the more I put that bad signal up, the more I do feel peaceful and rewarded by the universe. And there are rock star friends of mine who are you know, who are playing Coachella and crushing it and they're on the radio and that looks fun, but I'm not sure that was ever my road. You know, I don't think that was my road. I think if it was, I would have been on it, you know, so that's that's a really good point. Let's, let's highlight that. If that was your road, you would have been on it. You would have done what you needed to do to be on it. Yeah. Yeah. And and though in in the early days, maybe some of those decisions and, 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 and things were being done subconsciously. Now they're done a little more consciously, you know. When someone says, hey, do you want to work on a, a pitch for a Huggy song and, you know, we could make a ton of money on this thing, you know, if I really found myself sitting there with nothing to do, maybe yes, but probably not. Probably I'm not going to put my time and energy towards that. Probably I think my time and energy is better served writing my songs, being Stephen Kellogg and doing what I'm doing. So what I noticed about you 
and I had to learn this for myself, is there's TED Talk Stephen, right, who I met first. And TED Talk Stephen, you know, kind of brushed his hair, shaved, right, tucked in his shirt, like, like you know, TED Talk Stephen, you know, put together a TED Talk. He put together an idea, and he, and he, and he imparted it on people. And then there's, there's stage Stephen, who's a lot looser, wears a bandana, like, you know, and, and was, was, was um, a bit of a different persona. Both authentic, mm -hmm. both you, right? Uh, but it was a range. So, like, you added certain ingredients to TED Talk, Stephen, and then you added certain, ingre certain ingredients to Rockstar, Stephen. Then there's Daddy Stephen, right, who's doing hula hoops with his daughters, right? right? And, and, but you, you add certain special sauce there. And the whole point, you know, like you said, you, wanted to, you want to step into other things, to new things, so now you're speaking more, is, is how do you take that authentic self and then add range to those things so that you can bring Steven and then a little something extra over here, bring Steven and a little something over here. Sure. Well, you know, the, the TED Talk was an interesting transition in my life because I had only been rock and roll guy for 10 years. Um, I mean, occasionally I'd pop by a school or something and talk to the kids or something, but I wasn't, it didn't really occur to me that there could be other mediums for the message that I, that I had, you know. Um, and the TED Talk, when, Ted, when I was approached about doing a TED Talk, they, they came to me as a musician. But I, my big thing with that was I said, I don't feel like an expert at music. I feel like I'm sort of an expert at living. You know, my life feels really balanced. And so for a lot of people, this is a really rich way to live. You know, and the TED Talk was my first. I, I, I had to find a place to communicate with people when I did that TED Talk that was going to be not just here's what I know about music because I just thought there's so many people who are so much more um, <clears throat> versed in that area, you know. And when I did that, I started to see, oh, you could speak and you could do that. And I eventually learned that led to, oh, I could write, you know, just even posting more on Facebook and Instagram and viewing those as ways to connect with people and realizing that what I loved about music was the opportunity to connect with people. And to say, here's what I think, and hopefully have it help them in some capacity. And so as I honed that, and the TED Talk was in 2013, as I kind of honed that between then and now, the world has really started to open up. Because it doesn't particularly matter to me whether I'm you know, teaching a seminar, talking to an executive, playing a rock and roll concert, you know, uh, talking to my kids. These are all just ways that I'm sharing my hard fought for insights or whatever. Um, so the only thing that's really different, I'm always sort of have these core things I believe, uh, you know, the only thing that's particularly different is you kind of know your audience. You learn is, you know, knowing your audience a little bit. And when I play at a rock and roll show and everybody's out and they've you know, maybe had a couple drinks and they're sitting there for their night out, I'm going to approach that slightly differently than I am uh, a group of executives, you know, who are there for their annual meeting and I've been brought in to kind of play a little and talk a little, something like that. Um, I'm just going to, I only, I don't ever adjust the core of what I'm talking about or sharing, It's but I am just sort of adjusting the presentation a little. Exact, exactly, and that's where that's where the range comes in and takes you to new places. Yeah, and I and I and I, and I enjoy it so much. I think it, I did a I did something pretty recently for a group, a YPO group, Young Presidents Organization, and these guys, they're just so successful in the traditional sense of what success is, and I just thought it was hilarious to be the guy sitting there telling them how they can improve their multi-million dollar companies, you know, and I, I, I run a mom and pop thing that is like me and my bandmates and my wife and my kids help fill online orders. I mean, and, and I just thought this is cool. This is really cool. And these guys are smart to bring me in because it is a fresh perspective, but I get a, such a kick out of getting to be that 
to them too, you know, it's, it's just, it's cool. That's awesome. So 90% of my audience are those business people who are looking for a fresh perspective. How do they, how do they get in touch with you to have you come talk and sing and impart this wisdom? Uh, well, stephenkellogg.com. I mean, Google is your friend in this case. If you just were to go to my, my website, stephenkellogg.com, uh, there's a contact link. And, I, you know, so if, if, people, if people are interested enough that they can go and they click on that, and then that'll connect you to, you know, speaking inquiries, booking, my manager, you'll have, you'll have all the necessary information right there on my website. And we'll, we'll put all that in the show notes. So any final cool. notes on, the, on the just being in midlife, a little bit of gray in your beard, uh, you know, next chapters as your, as your daughters grow up and start to date and do all that stuff, anything you want to leave people with? Oh, well, there's so much that I'd love to talk about about midlife. I think it's, like, like I said, this, the, the latest epiphany has been this idea that, whoa, we're, we're supposed to keep creating here in midlife. Like, it's not done. Um, and I, th I may have said that night at the show, you know, this realization that perhaps you've lived long, there's more behind you than in front of you, you know, more time has passed than lay ahead. And so, you know, the, this thing I've been doing recently is just not wanting to find myself pining away for the best part of the past, you know, not wanting to just reach back to. Uh, a moment in time when things seemed good, you know, uh, but in fact, wanting to write new chapters that are ju as exciting, you know, and not, and, and, and yet it's so easy to get stuck, you know, thinking about, oh man, this was a good patch there in my 20s or my 30s, you know, and now here we are, and, and that's a relatively new thing for me. That's something I've only kind of come to in this last year, but man, is it fun and exciting, you know, and, and, uh, and so writing new chapters for ourselves, you know, that are embracing what lay ahead, embracing getting to raise a teenager and go through this. This is going to be fun and it's going to be over before we know it. So uh, I've, t I've totally reapproached like my daughter's boyfriend in a, in a brand new way, you know, and, and it's, it's a good thing. It's fun, you know. I don't know what that the equivalent is for you necessarily in your life. I'm, 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 50, I'm 56, and I have a, a kid who's graduating college in, in a week and another one who's in Israel right now uh, on a gap year program. So my kids, you know, my kids are grown up. They shave. They, you know, they have their own opinions, their own political. And, and I thought, uh, I really thought I, I wouldn't be around at this point. Uh, so for me, it's all gravy. And I wake up every day now not thinking about the past not thinking about anything other than what can I create today? You know, this, the only, the, any, any thought other than what do I want to create in relationship? What do I want to cre create in business? What do I want to create in art? What do I want to create in legacy is a complete waste of time for me. Uh, and the joy and the freedom that has come from that, uh, knowing that my brain, my monkey mind wants to say anything other than creation is a complete waste of time for me. And since then, the joy and the juiciness of being 56 years old is unparalleled. I, uh, you know, I, I may have had more fun when I was 20 and drunk and all that, but I have never been more satisfied, juicy, joyful, free, and, uh, you know, yeah. ever. Well, I mean, I, it feels like 40s and 50s, and obviously I don't know because I'm – It's but it feels like this is the sweet spot of where you're equipped enough for life but you're also not completely up against the physical stuff yet. You know, your, your body isn't, I mean, hopefully your body's not letting you down too much, too much. I mean, we all, there's aches and pains and rolled ankles and, you know, we laugh about that and it is, it is not the same as being a, a young person in that sense, but really, you know, you can still get away with some things and, and it's this, for, not for everybody, but for, but for, the majority of us, I think, I'd be surprised if this isn't like the stretch of life that is going to be the most fulfilling, and that's that's thrilling to me. To I can I can I can tell you, being a bit ahead of you on the journey, it, you know, it's what you make it. So again, right. what are you creating? Are you creating art? You're creating business. You're creating legacy. You're creating relationship. What are you creating? And uh, you know, that doesn't stop until you die. Yeah, I know. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you I, so much. Yeah, yeah, man. Thank you, Mark. It's, it's, uh, I really appreciate you sharing your wisdom. I'm going to put uh, all your music, your your videos, your 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 TED talk, your Amazon, everything about you online. Uh, and really, if you're if you're a business leader and you're listening to this and you, you want someone to come speak and really move your people, have Stephen come uh, speak to your organization. Yeah, it's a pleasure. I love this stuff. I love talking about it. And I, I uh, thank you for doing your podcast and, and for having me on. Stephen, thank you so much. And to everybody else, have a great rest of the day. And I love you.